welcome to Nazarene Israel. My name is Norman Willis, and in this video series, we are talking all about the feasts of the first month. And we included in this some repurposed videos that we made earlier on the Melchizedekian Pesach. And that's the Passover meal that we keep when we're under Yeshua's renewed Melchizedekian order. And as the Pesach ends, that's when Hag Hamatzot, or the Feast of Unleavened Bread, begins. And that's actually when the Pesach meal is eaten, is on the evening of the very first day of Hag Hamatzot, or the Feast of Unleavened Bread, begins. So we've been getting a lot of questions about how do we eat that meal. People are making requests for a Pesach Seder for Nazarene Israel. We're also getting specific requests for a Passover Haggadah script, which is a step-by-step -step instructions for how we go about that meal. So we're going to cover all that information and a whole lot more in this video. Stay with us. We're going to rejoin the storyline in Exodus chapter 11 and verse 1, where Yahweh says to Moshe that he's going to bring yet one more plague on Paro, or Pharaoh, and on Egypt. And after that, Paro is going to let Israel go. And when he lets Israel go, Paro is going to drive Israel out of Egypt. And the purpose is this lets us know it's going to be a very hasty event. And we understand the reason why it was hasty. In chapter 12, in verse 29, we're told that it came to pass that at midnight that the death angel, but Yahweh, struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Paro, who sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the captive in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of livestock. So Paro arose in the night, he and all of his servants, and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one that was dead. And the Egyptians urged the people that they might send the Israelites out of the land of Egypt in haste, for they said, We shall all be dead. So the people took their dough before it was leavened, having their kneading bowls bound up in their clothes and on their shoulders. And so what we see is that the flight was so hasty, they didn't even have time to leaven the bread or to allow it to rise. And in verse 37, then the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Sukkot, about 600,000 men on foot, besides children. And that's where, in verse 39, they finally baked unleavened cakes of the dough which they'd brought out of Egypt. Because the dough wasn't leavened, because they were driven out of Egypt and could not wait, nor had they had the time to prepare provisions for themselves. So it's very interesting. When they arrived at Sukkot, which is the same word as tabernacles, that's when they were able to cook. So what's interesting is that we know the feasts are prophetic shadow pictures of coming things. But what we see is there's mirror imaging in these prophetic shadow pictures of coming things. One of the ways we see this is in the first month. First we have a half day event in the afternoon called the Pesach or Passover. Then that's followed immediately by a seven-day feast called Hag HaMatzot, or the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Then in the seventh month, we're going to see a seven-day feast called Sukkot, or the Feast of Tabernacles. That's the same name as where the children of Israel were finally able to cook their unleavened bread. But that's going to be followed immediately by a half-day event in the morning called Shemini Yetzirah, or the Eighth-Day Assembly. Now we're going to talk a lot more about this when we talk about the ancient Hebrew wedding model. But what we see is that the Pesach is very important to Yahweh, and it also should be very important to us. So in Shemot, or Exodus chapter 12, and verse 14, Yahweh says, This day is to be to us as a memorial. We are to keep it as a feast to Yahweh throughout our generations. We're supposed to keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. And we're going to see why in just a few verses. So what that means, obviously, is no matter whether we live inside the land of Israel or out in the dispersion, we're going to keep the Pesach. But not just the Pesach. Because Yahweh is referring here not only to the Pesach, but also to Hag Hamatzot, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Because he talks about them basically like it's one big eight-day-long feast. 
And the way we know that is in the very next verse, in verse 15, he says, For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. He says, On the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses. Now, traditionally, our Orthodox brethren, uh, they begin to scour their houses, and they do what they call a deep Pesach cleaning, starting about two or maybe even three weeks ahead of the Pesach. Uh, They're very thorough. They've been known to remove windows from frames. I've heard of them removing grout from tile, all these kinds of things, just to make sure they get rid of leaven. Uh, So, uh, but technically, we are allowed to remove leaven on the first day of Hag HaMatzot if we have not gotten rid of it the day before or prior to that. It's very important to get rid of the leaven. Yahweh says, for whoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. And later we're going to see why. And that's because leaven represents sin. It also represents false doctrine, which effectively is sinful. We'll talk a lot more about that. Verse 16, he says, On the first day there shall be a set-apart rehearsal, or mikra kodesh. It's very important. We'll talk about that in the next slide. And on the seventh day, there shall be a set-apart rehearsal, or mikra kodesh, for you. He says, No manner of work shall be done on them, but that which everyone must eat. That only may be prepared by you. So what we're supposed to do is, on the night of the Pesach, we're to eat the Pesach, and that's typically in our homes. But on the next day, during the day of the first day of unleavened bread, we're supposed to gather together in our assemblies to pray and to prepare to leave the dispersion and go back to the land of Israel as an ordered nation. There's a lot of Messianics, a lot of Ephraimites, a lot of two-house people. uh, They're avoiding, or they don't know, or they're ignorant of the need to behave as an ordered nation. But that's so important. We're going to need this one day in the not very distant future. And we'll talk about that a lot in just a couple of slides here. But first we want to talk about the definition of a mikra. So a set-apart rehearsal is a mikra kodesh. How do we know? Well, we come to Strong's Hebrew Concordance. It's 4744. It's mikra. It's from a root of 7121. And that's something called out. That is a public meeting. So Yahweh is calling us out to come join him in a public meeting. And it also serves as a rehearsal. So there's going to be an assembly. We're going to convoke or convene an assembly. And that's going to serve as a rehearsal. So what are we rehearsing? Again, we're praying and we're rehearsing leaving Egypt or leaving the dispersion as an ordered nation, meaning as the armies of the living Elohim. We're going to see it's ignored right now by most of the movement, but that's so important, and we're not going to be in Yahweh's favor without that component because he calls us as an ordered nation. As he says in the next verse, verse 17, he says, So you shall observe Hag Hamatzot, for on this same day I will have brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. So he's calling us out of Egypt as an army, as an ordered whole, not just some gaggle of individuals. So there's a structure to what we're supposed to be doing, and that's what he wants us to do. And it's so important to him, he tells us to memorialize this by observing this day throughout our generations as an everlasting ordinance, because this is when we began to become an ordered nation. We were tribes before. But when we were called out of the land of Egypt, when we, went, when we left Egypt to go back to the land of Israel, that's when we began to be an ordered nation. So we celebrate this. On the first month, on the 14th day of the month, at evening, we are to eat unleavened bread, and we're to eat it until the 21st day of the month, at evening. In verse 19 he says, For seven days no leaven meaning no sin, no false doctrine, shall be found in your houses. Since whoever eats what is leavened, that same person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel. Meaning, if we're sinning or if we're practicing false doctrine, which is sinful, we shall be cut off from the nation of Israel. No matter whether we're returning Gentile Ephraimite, a stranger, or whether we're a native of the land. 
meaning we can be either a returning Gentile Ephraimite or we can be an Israeli-born Jewish believer in Yeshua. But if we're practicing false doctrine, it's all for naught. We're going to be cut off. So he says, you shall eat nothing leavened. You shouldn't partake of sin or of false doctrine anywhere. He says, in all of your dwellings, we'll look at this word next, the word is Moshabotechem, you shall eat unleavened bread, meaning the pure doctrine, the true doctrine. Well, we take a look at this word Moshabotechem, it's Strong's Old Testament Concordance 4186, Moshav, and you've got a variety of pronunciations there. It's from a root of 3427. It means a seat. So Shev is sit, so Moshav is a seat. Figuratively, a site where you sit, a place where your seat is. Abstractly, a session of sitting. Or by extension, because in Hebrew we take things to their logical extension, an abode. By implication, a population, the people who sit. Well, if we take the people who sit, or the population, and they're dwelling in a certain place, that means they are inhabiting a certain place. By extension, we have what's called a community, a moshav, that refers to a community. How do we know? We look up the root at 3427, it's yashav. It's a primitive root. Again, shev means to sit, so this means properly to sit down. By implication, we're going to keep sitting down. We're going to dwell. That means we're going to remain. Causatively, we're going to settle or form a settlement. We're going to abide. We're going to have dwelling places, a community where our people are settling, where the population is settling. So we're going to have habitations. So we're going to inhabit them. This is the place where we inhabit. So that means we're going to remain, we're going to settle down. This is the place where our people are settling in. So that's a moshav. That's the term. So we see a second witness to this in Exodus 13 in verse 7. Yahweh says, Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days. And no leavened bread, symbolic of sin, symbolic of false doctrine, shall be seen among you nor shall leaven even be seen among you in all of your quarters. Now the word here is gevulecha. It means boundaries or borders. So what Yahweh is really saying here is that no leaven shall even be seen among us. No false doctrine, no sin is even to be seen among us in all of our borders or all of our boundaries, or we are to be cut off. So how do we know? We're going to look up this word. So we're going to come to our one of our favorite books, Strong's Hebrew Concordance. Look it up. It's Hebrew 1366. Gevul. Now here's a variety of pronunciations again. It comes from a root of 1379. Now properly it refers to a twisted chord. But by implication what we're talking about is this is the chord we use to mark our boundaries. And by extension this is the territory within our boundaries, meaning of the land of Israel. So this is the borders of the land of Israel. So what Yahweh is saying is that no leaven, no sin, no false doctrine is even to be seen among us in all of our borders, all of our boundaries, anything that pertains to our communities, anything that pertains to the places that we inhabit and where we dwell. There should be no leaven, no sin, and no false doctrine as a minimum for seven days. And of course, hopefully, for much longer than that. We look up the root at 1379. Again, it's properly to twist as a rope, but it means to bound as by a border rope, by a border line. So it refers to a border or bounds. So again, Yahweh is saying, we're not even supposed to see sin. We're not even supposed to see false doctrine anywhere our people dwell. That's what he's really going for. That's what he wants to see. And he says, And you shall observe this thing as an ordinance for you and your sons forever. He says, And it will come to pass when you come to the land which Yahweh will give you, just as he has promised, that you shall keep this service. So we're supposed to keep Hag HaMatzot and become purer year by year, so that one day when we come back to the land of Israel, there won't be sin and there won't be false doctrine 
because we've been practicing being leaven free year by year up until that time. Now this is something we wanted to include in the PASOC study, but there was so much information we basically forgot about it. But it's important because it pertains here, because the Pesach meal is eaten on the first day of unleavened bread in the evening starting the first day of unleavened bread. So in Shemot or Exodus chapter 12 in verse 48, Yahweh says, Now when a stranger, now think about a returning Gentile Ephraimite, when a stranger dwells with you and wants to keep the Pesach to Yahweh, let all of his males be circumcised. So all the males in the house need to be circumcised. Then let him come near and keep it, and he shall be as a native of the land. He says, For no uncircumcised person shall eat of it. Verse 49, he says, You're not going to have two standards. You're not going to have double standards here. One Torah shall be for the native-born and for the stranger who dwells among you. So there's not going to be a difference between native-born Jews and returning Gentile Ephraimites. There's one standard that applies to all. Now the reason we mention it here is this applies to the Pesach meal itself, eaten on the night starting the first day of unleavened bread. However, we're not sure, we don't believe it applies to the rest of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So to comment on this, one thing that happens is there are Christians that they hear that the Last Supper was held after the form of a Passover Seder, and so they get curious, and so they want to come see what is a Passover Seder like, because they, they believe they want to see what the Last Supper was like, and then the problem is that somebody gives them this rote traditional Seder that has nothing to do with what Yeshua did on the Last Supper. But they've heard that, so they want to come partake of the Pesach with us. And the problem is that they can't really, because the Pesach is supposed to be a closed, or what might be called a closed feast. So in order to attend the Pesach, all of the males in the household need to be physically circumcised. So if you have questions on that, we talk about this all throughout our works, but if you're looking for a good place to start, you might try Making Sense of Circumcision. That's in Nazarene Scripture Studies, Volume 3. And in that study, we show why all males will need to be circumcised. So Pesach really is closed. We don't need a bunch of tourists at the Pesach. And if you want to hold a training Seder or something like that, that's, that's a fine thing you can do for evangelization purposes. But the Pesach itself really is a very serious time of reflection and prayer, uh, praying from the heart to Yahweh. It shouldn't be held in the manner of a rote modern Passover Seder. Uh, really, that's what the Feast of Sukkot is for. That's what the Feast of Tabernacles is for. Tabernacles or Sukkot is an open feast, and anyone from the nation can come. But the Pesach meal itself is a serious time of prayer and being with Yahweh. So one of the things we know is that the Last Supper doesn't change the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So as we saw in our study on the Last Supper, which earlier in this series, the Last Supper was not the Pesach. Rather, the Last Supper was the night before the Pesach. So because of that, the Last Supper doesn't have anything to say about the Pesach. It doesn't change the Pesach. It doesn't change the Feast of Unleavened Bread. If you'd like more information on that, please see our study called The Last Supper earlier in this series, The Feast of the First Month. Because we know that the disciples continued to keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Pesach. So the Apostle Shaul, or Paul, tells us in 1 Corinthians, or Corinthian Aleph, chapter 5, starting in verse 7, he says, Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you are now truly unleavened. He says, For indeed, Mashiach, our Pesach, was sacrificed for us, he says, therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. He's talking about a spiritual change that needs to take place in us. And here he's using the Greek word for unleavened bread, which is adzumos. But we should really talk about leaven. 
We're going to talk about what leaven is in Scripture. So we know what leaven is today. We can go to the grocery store. We can go to the supermarket. We can buy it. We can buy it in packets. We can buy it in jars, this kind of a thing. But what is leaven in Scripture? And what does it mean, the leaven in Scripture? And how do we get rid of this leaven? And what's leaven symbolic of? What does leaven represent? Well, we're going to see it's symbolic of sin. It's also symbolic of false doctrine, and we need to get rid of these things. That's the main point behind the prophetic shadow picture. So how do we know? Okay, we'll come to Strong's Hebrew Concordance, because then you know what you got and what you don't got. So Strong's Hebrew, 7603, the term is seor. It's from 7604. We'll look at that next. It says barm or yeast cake. Now we're going to look at barm next. It says as swelling by fermentation, in other words, leaven. We look at the root, 7604. It's sha'ar. It's a primitive root properly to swell up. Now what happens basically is that leaven has bacteria. The bacteria eat the sugars either of the crushed grapes or of the grains and the bacteria let off gas. And so this gas is what leavens or raises the bread. So that's how leaven works. Now, we come here to Wikipedia to know a little bit more about what this barm is. And we see that barm is the foam or scum formed on the top of a fermenting liquid such as beer or wine. Mm -mm, yuck. Okay. Or it's also the foam or scum of feedstocks for spirits or industrial ethanol distillation. Now, in terms of leavening bread, it's used to leaven bread. It can also be used to set up fermentation in a new batch of liquor. So this barm has a leavening agent. It's a leavening action. So it says, as a leaven, barm has also been made out of ground millet combined with the must out of wine tubs. Okay, and sometimes is used in English baking as a synonym for natural leaven. Basically, we're talking about sourdough starter. Now, sourdough starter is a very healthy way to eat your bread. The fermentation process helps break things down so the body can digest it much more easily, just not during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So, continuing in Wikipedia, it says various leavening cultures derived from barm, here's a big word, usually Saccharomyces cerevisiae, it says, became ancestral to most forms of brewer's yeast, brewer's yeast referring to beer and wine, and also to modern baker's yeast, which refers to bread and baking, that are currently on the market today. So, okay, so now in simple language, in plain language, what that means is that barm, which is the floating scum you've got on the top of beer or wine. That's the ancestor, both of brewer's yeast, which is what they used to make beer or wine, and also of baker's yeast, which is what they used to bake bread. But the problem is that since the barm is the ancestor, you can substitute one for the other. And in fact, just Google or DuckDuckGo or do an internet search for beer bread, or you can search for uh, making beer and wine with baker's yeast or making bread or baking with brewer's yeast and you'll see there's many recipes. It changes the flavor significantly but you can absolutely do it. Both of those, brewer's yeast and baker's yeast, can absolutely be used to leaven bread. Now for anyone who is making wine or beer, whether commercially or homebrew or whatever you're doing, there's some things to be aware of. So. First, the land of Israel is in the Northern Hemisphere. Now, in the land of Israel, barley is typically harvested at the start of the harvest year. There are some places in the Northern Hemisphere where barley is harvested at the end of the year. That's a separate subject. Wine grapes also are typically harvested at the end of the harvest year. Now, I don't know the technical details about making beer and wine. I'm a Nazarite. I don't drink alcohol, but one way or another, you want to be sure to finish with the barming process before Hag HaMatzot. So what that means is now, especially if you live in the Southern Hemisphere, the harvest dates are going to be inverted. So one way or another, you're going to need to pay attention to what are the dates of Hag HaMatzot in the land of Israel. 
and then you're going to have to be sure to conclude any kind of a barming process before Hag Hamatzot hits. So it's just, I'm not sure the details, but that's something that you'll need to deal with. But most of us aren't making homebrew. Or most of us aren't making beer or wine for a living. Most of us just want to know, how can we deleaven our homes? What's the scriptural requirement? What, just tell me what I need to do, right? Okay, so the scriptural requirement is to get rid of anything that can be used to leaven bread. Now that's going to include yeast. It's going to include baking soda. It's going to include baking powder. It's also going to include sourdough starter. Now, sourdough starter is great. Uh, we used to eat that as a child. It effectively ferments the grain or the batter, the dough, and the fermentation process makes it easier to digest. It also gives a certain flavor. A lot of people think it tastes really good. However, not during Hag Hamatsot. So, uh, there's also barm, again, we just spoke about to get rid of, uh, the, get rid of any scum from making beer or wine, and we'll talk about that again in just a little bit. But most of us just want to know, how can we deleaven our homes? So, we know there's certain foods that typically contain leaven. Well, some of them are easy to spot. So, bread, muffins, pizza crust, uh, most cereals are leavened because they like make things nice and light and fluffy and make them easy to crunch. Also, you have many flat breads. You might think, well, flat bread, that's not really raised, it's flat. But most of your flat breads, yes, they do contain leaven. Most of your crackers contain leaven. Tortilla shells, taco shells, uh, pita breads, flat type breads, those all typically contain leaven. Now, some dog and cat foods also contain active yeast, that's important if you have a kosher dog or cat. Or if you want your dog or cat to be kosher, time to throw that food out. Now you also have many foods that you might not suspect. Some ice creams contain leaven. Uh, fish sticks, the batter on fish sticks contains leaven. There's also some canned soups. Either they'll add the leaven to the canned soup to make it taste good, or especially if you have noodles, quite often the noodles can be leavened. So the main thing is that leaven can hide in places you really don't expect. So check the ingredients and check both your freezer and your pantry. Check all of your food. If you haven't done that before the Pesach, a very good day to do that is on the first day of unleavened bread. Okay, now to get technical, what it all comes down to is, if any leavening agent can be used to make bread rise, we need to get rid of it. We need to get it out of our houses and make sure we don't eat it for seven days. However, if it cannot be used to make bread rise, we might not need to remove it from our properties. Okay, now, to be technical, and I don't know all the details on this, but if you have bottled beer, or bottled wine, it may have yeast or some yeast residue in it. However, it can't be used to make bread rise because it doesn't have that same barm. Remember, it's the barm that we're trying to get rid of. Anything that can be used to make bread rise, that's what we need to get rid of. Uh, forgive me if I don't know the technical details on that. I don't drink. Well, uh, the rabbis, <laughs> I, I hope I will say this respectfully, I don't mean to laugh, but the rabbis give several technical recommendations for Pesach that we advise you completely ignore. Uh, now, the Ashkenazi tradition in particular, that's the, the German or the European Ashkenazi tradition, they prohibit any food that contains hametz. Now, the way it's the way they define hametz that comes into play. So, they define hametz as any leavened bread, or which is fine, that part's fine, or anything else that is made with wheat, barley, oats, spelt, or rye. In other words, you can't even have a bowl of boiled, you, you can't have pearled barley. You can't have boiled rye. They, they don't permit that because uh, it might get leavened somehow. Now, the Ashkenazic tradition also prohibits what they call kidney oat, and that's things that look like those grains. So that means rice, 
corn, soy, millet, beans, peas, almost all legumes, so almost all beans, or anything deriving from those products because someone might think or someone might mistake that as being from those prohibited hametz grains. Um, the rabbis like to make their rules. They also prohibit anything deriving from those products like corn syrup, tofu, uh, soy oil, uh, sesame seeds, sesame seed oil, fennel, peanuts. Uh, peanuts are technically a legume. Uh, those kinds of things. We just recommend ignoring that. And I say that with respect, but we are to speak the truth in love. There's some other recommendations the rabbis make. We just simply can't go along with them. The rabbis recommend, or, and again, different rabbis have different rules, but some of the rabbinical rules advise throwing out any household products that contain baking soda. So there's certain laundry detergents and certain toothpaste. For example, Arm & Hammer makes a fine detergent. Uh, they also make a good toothpaste. Uh, the rabbis say to throw those out. And what they're doing is they're adding what they call fence laws to the Torah. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to add additional rules to the Torah so that you don't accidentally break Yahweh's Torah. Well, okay, but, you know, not okay. Because Yahweh strictly prohibits us from doing that in places like Deuteronomy 4 and verse 2, Deuteronomy 12 and verse 32, and in other places. I mean, uh, not to be cheeky, but, you know, why don't you just throw out all the food, you know, and just fat, or you can eat only unleavened bread for seven days. You know, the problem is, it's no longer Yahweh's Torah, now it becomes our Torah, and Yahweh doesn't like that. You know, I mean, why do we need to throw out the toothpaste? Are we going to be using it to leaven our bread? Are we going to use the laundry detergent to leaven our bread? <laughs> Oosh. Okay, uh, enough said. So there are some health supplements that you should be aware of. Now, there are some anti-cholesterol supplements, red yeast rice, also brewer's yeast. These have a very beneficial and healthful effect. Uh, some people also, they like to add yeast to their popcorn, for example. Uh, now, I've never seen anyone take a brewer's yeast tablet and crush it and use it to leaven their bread. I, I've never seen anyone break a veggie capsule and pour it into their bread dough and use it to leaven. Uh, so even though these are not typically used to leaven food, the problem is that they can leaven food. And Yahweh says not only to not eat these things, but not to have them anywhere within our borders. Now, we can't do much in the dispersion However, what we can do is if you have these products uh, and you don't want to just throw them out, one thing you can do that's a good witness is you can give it to your neighbors. And this gives a witness and testimony of our faith. We believe enough in what we're doing to give these products away so that we ourselves don't have to partake of them during this time. Now, another thing we recommend is to completely ignore the rabbinic kosher for Passover designation. Uh, the rabbi, it would take too long to explain. It would take uh, hours and hours. We don't, we don't have the hours. We don't care. <laughs> Not interested. But the rabbis have all kinds of very intricate. It can be kosher for Passover, but not kosher for the Passover meal. Or then you have certain kinds that, yes, they're kosher for the Passover meal and for all of Passover. They have other kinds of matzah that's labeled not kosher for Passover. Just forget all that. What we recommend instead, respectfully, is to focus instead on eating organic or at least eating natural. Because it's sad to say, and I'm not sure exactly when they began this process, uh, but I think about 10 years ago, people began to become aware that a lot of farmers are using uh, what's called glyphosate or Roundup. Basically, it's a modification or a derivative of Agent Orange, which is a very serious known carcinogen. Uh, basically, it melts plants and other carbon-based, where it, it melts plants. It melts carbon-based life forms. And what they do is that the uh, a, a barley field or a wheat field, it comes, it doesn't come ripe all evenly. 
because you have different conditions in parts of the field. And so what the farmers have learned to do, at least in modern times, is if they will spray the whole field with Roundup, it kills the plant, and then so now all of the barley or all of the wheat or all of the spelt, all the grain is going to ripen uniformly. But the problem is the Agent Orange or the glyphosate or the Roundup gets on the grain. So our recommendation would be to ignore the rabbinical rules because those things completely transgress Yahweh's commandments and focus again on organic, or if you can't get organic, at least try to get natural. That would be our recommendation. Now this is a photo of an Israeli supermarket with 11 products concealed for Pesach. Now this is the rabbinic interpretation when Yahweh says, let no leaven be seen within your borders, they're just going to cover it up. So they put up a plastic or a tarp or whatever they put up. You can go into the stores, you'll see uh, ice creams covered, you'll see breads, crackers, cookies, uh, also canned goods, all sorts of anything that has leaven, they're going to cover it up. And the problem is this does not fulfill the requirement to remove it from our borders. Okay, this the leaven is still within our settlements. So we're not fulfilling the requirement here. Okay, a word to the wise is sufficient. Another rabbinical ruling, uh, try to be respectful, but their Pesach cleaning is very difficult. It's very different, and we don't understand the point. Now, we, don't have anything, we don't have anything against a good deep cleaning. Uh, cleanliness, that's a very good thing. But because our Orthodox brothers, basically, they don't have the same spirit that we do. We are blessed with a different spirit. The rabbis and the uh, Karaites don't have that. So basically what our Orthodox brothers do is they try to remove effectively every, every bit, every molecule, every speck of leaven from their homes, but then they leave them in the grocery store and just cover them up. So again, it doesn't make sense. Why don't you just cover your home up? Just throw a bunch of tarps around your home and then you don't have to clean it or, you know, okay, well, um, you know, another problem is when they fled Egypt, they did so in haste and they were in so much of a hurry, there wasn't any time to do a deep scouring on their homes. There was no time to do a deep Passover cleaning on their homes. So what are we doing here? We're trying to scour our homes so we can hand them over to Pharaoh. You know, what, what is the point? And again, we don't have anything against a deep cleaning. If you want to do a deep cleaning, that's a very good thing. But just don't add rules to Yahweh's Torah. Don't make up your own rules and put Yahweh's name on them. Yahweh doesn't like that. So again, we recommend advise to beware of the leaven or the rabbinical rulings. Now, something else that is rabbinical that we get a lot of requests for is we get a lot of requests to issue our own Passover Seder service. And specifically, we get a request for what's called the Pesach or the Passover Haggadah, which basically is a booklet that you can follow that tells you exactly page by page how to conduct the Pesach. And typically, we believe we probably we get these requests because a lot of people look at the Messianic Jews and uh, the rabbis. And so they see these Passover Seder booklets. They see the, the Pesach Haggadah service. And they're aware that the Last Supper was held in a similar fashion to a modern Pesach Seder. And so they figure that since today they're using a Haggadah booklet, that they should as well. Well, uh, the problem is that that's not how it goes. So the problem is that the Pesach Haggadah is literally a rote script. And Yeshua was never in favor of rote prayers. Yeshua was never in favor of scripts but he always was in favor of praying from the heart. So we saw that in our studies on the ancient synagogue service. Also, if we just take a look, we take a look at our study on the Last Supper, the Last Supper was very much not scripted. And we see Yeshua making long prayers at the Last Supper. So Yeshua was always in favor of praying from the heart and never praying by rote. And so that's what we also should do. Again, Yeshua had never had anything good to say about rote prayers or those who prayed them. In fact, in Matthew or Matthew Yahoo chapter 6 and verse 7, Yeshua said, And when you pray, 
do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. And, you know, for Yeshua to use the word heathen, he's talking about those who were trying to introduce rote prayers, because when you pray by rote, and when you have a service by rote, where is the function of the heart? You know, wh- where does that go? Uh, it flies out the window, it leaves, it walks out the door. Yeshua was always in favor of praying by heart. Something very, very important to Yeshua should be very important to us also. Another reason that we don't want to issue a Passover Seder booklet or a Pesach Haggadah is that Yahweh gives us his own Pesach Haggadah right there in the text. We take a look, Yahweh tells us what to do, how to do it, when to do it, the whole thing. We take a look at Shemot or Exodus chapter 12 and verse 8. Yahweh says, Then they shall eat the flesh of the Pesach on that night. So he's telling us we're going to eat the Pesach when we're going to eat it. We're going to eat it on the evening beginning the first day of unleavened bread. And then we're going to gather in prayer the next day and have as a rehearsal. But we're going to eat it on that night roasted in fire with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs. And he even tells us how to eat it. Three verses later in verse 11, he says, this is how you eat it with your belt on your waist, with your shoes on your feet and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in haste because you're getting ready to leave Egypt. You're rehearsing leaving Egypt. It is Yahweh's Passover. Now, we don't want to add or take away anything from Yahweh's words because Yahweh tells us very clearly, do not add and do not take anything away from his word or elsewise it's no longer his word. Now it's our own word. So we're effectively setting ourselves up kind of in the demigod role. And that's not a good thing to do. Yahweh doesn't like that. Now, we would add some qualifiers. So we saw earlier that the feasts and the new moon days and the Sabbaths, those are all prophetic shadow pictures of things that are still to come. Okay, well, again, we've got prophetic shadow pictures. The question is, what are we rehearsing? Okay, well, okay, so speaking to those of us who are Jewish believers in Yeshua living in the land of Israel. Yeshua tells us what to do. In Matthew or Mati Yahu, chapter 24, starting in verse 15, Yeshua says that when you see the abomination that makes desolate, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the set apart place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. So what this means is, if we're living in the land of Israel, then we will need to flee the land of Israel when the abomination of desolation is set up. And as we spoke of in other places, that takes place during the second half of the tribulation. So if you live in the land of Israel, you should rehearse fleeing, and that means eating the Pesach meal in haste. However, conversely, for those of us on the Ephraimite side of the house, or for those Jews who are presently sojourning with Ephraim in the dispersion, there will come an event called the second exodus. And we're told in Yeshayahu or Isaiah chapter 52 and verse 12, that when the second exodus comes, we shall not go out with haste, nor shall we go by flight, because Yahweh will go before us and the Elohim of Israel will be our rear guard. So we know that we're not going to flee in that time. So is it really necessary to eat in haste? Or can we spend more time praying? So just as a summary, again, the all-important question, what are we rehearsing? What are we getting ready to do? If you're living inside the land of Israel, you should be eating in haste because you're rehearsing fleeing the land of Israel when the abomination that makes desolate is set up. At that point in time, then you'll be dwelling with the rest of us outside the land of Israel in the dispersion. And at that point in time, we need to rehearse going home to the land of Israel, but not in haste. Because Yahweh says, you shall not go out in haste nor go by flight. So 
when we're outside the land of Israel now, as we spoke about in the study on the Melchizedekian Pesach, yes, we're rehearsing leaving, but no, we're not rehearsing fleeing. So we're not going to eat the Pesach in haste, but we're going to spend more time praying from the heart, just like Yeshua spent more time praying from the heart during the Last Supper. That would be our recommendation. Now the next question that comes up is, what's the symbolism behind the bitter herbs? Because in Shemot or Exodus chapter 1 and verse 14, Yahweh says the Egyptians made our forefathers' lives very bitter with hard bondage in mortar, in brick, and in all manner of service in the field. And all their service in which they were made to serve was with rigor. So the general feeling, the general thought, or the consensus is that the bitter herbs are there to remind us of the bitterness of our slavery in Egypt. Well, okay, so Scripture doesn't tell us which bitter herbs. Now, that's probably by design. Uh, <laughs> now, Scripture is for everyone all over the world, in every nation, every tribe, every tongue, every nation, every family, every clan is now heir to salvation in Messiah Yeshua should they choose to accept it. Now there's a lot of different herbs all over the world. We don't know what the list is, but they should be bitter herbs for the Pesach. Now, if you do an internet search, there's some traditional herbs that are suggested that we feel really are more appropriate for children. They're really much too mild for adults. Uh, some of those would be celery seed, parsley, uh, they recommend romaine lettuce, these kind of things. Those are really too mild. To me, those don't call to mind the bitterness of slavery and hard bondage in all manner of work in the field and mortar and brick. Now, there's some herbs that we know of, Western herbs, that are more bitter. For example, horseradish, cumin, black cumin. Black cumin is very good for the health. Uh, the saying is it's the cure for everything but death. Uh, you know, <laughs> don't know about that, but it's it's extremely good for the health. There's also coriander, thyme, dandelion root, and marigold greens. Now, the hyssop, we know they had hyssop at the time of the first Pesach, uh, but avoid the oil. The oil gets too concentrated, but however, hyssop itself, uh, that's a very good bitter herb. Now, if you happen to have a health food store around you, there's some other uh, things we can recommend. Mugwort is bitter. Whorehound, endive, those are all bitter. Burdock root is very bitter. It's also good for the kidneys and liver. The same thing can be said true of yellow dock root and also dandelion root. It's very good for the kidneys and liver. There's also rue and wormwood. Those are very bitter and they're good for the stomach. Bitters typically are good for the stomach. Now, for those of you who want the bitterest herb, uh, the bitterest herb I know is horse chestnut. That is an extremely bitter herb. Uh, it is an extremely bitter taste. Uh, I don't believe it's, it's appropriate for children. If you're an adult and you want to do something extremely bitter, you could try horse chestnut, but uh, that might be for, for those of us who, who really want to appreciate just how bitter slavery was in Egypt for 430 years. One disclaimer check with your natural medical doctor if you have any medical concerns. Uh, herbs are very powerful. They should be safe for most people, but if you have medical concerns, please check with your medical doctor. So now let's talk about the symbolism of leaven. What is it that we're really doing here? Are we just following a bunch of rules just because we have to? Or what are we actually trying to do here? Well, one of the things we learn from reading Yeshua's words is that leaven is symbolic of false doctrine and false doctrine is sinful. So we want to avoid false doctrine however we can. And this is a bigger problem than people might think in the Messianic and Ephraimite and Two House movements. Now, uh, in Matthew, or Matthew Yahu, chapter 16 and verse 6, Yeshua said to his disciples, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. He's talking about the Orthodox rabbis and also the Karaites. So he's clearly telling us, avoid their false doctrine. It's not good for you. You're going to get misled. Somehow or other, you're going to stumble and fall. 
But some things don't change much. Uh, his disciples didn't understand. They didn't get it. So at verse 11, Yeshua says, How is it you don't understand that I did not speak to you concerning the leaven of bread, but to beware the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Oh, light bulb coming on. Then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but to beware of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, meaning the rabbis and the Karaites. And this is a bigger problem, I think, than people give it credit for, uh, because we have been talking about this for a long time, and we're going to be talking about it for a while more, because there's a lot of people who aren't truly understanding the dangers of following the rabbis and the dangers of following the Karaite doctrine. Because these are effectively stumbling blocks. They're alternate positions that don't lead to Yeshua's kingdom. So it's very important that we avoid them. Now, we have a lot of what might be called interfaith ministries here in the end times. We have interfaith new moon and barley inspection teams. We have uh, Christian evangelicals setting up uh, all kinds of interfaith activities with Brother Judah. And Brother Jude is very happy to let us play along into that trap. So just as the Roman Catholic Church has their ecumenical movement, the purpose of which is to get all the churches to come back in under the Pope, and many agreements have already been signed, there's also what you might call the New World Order, which is hosting its interfaith efforts with Messianics and Ephraimites, Evangelical Christians, and all these other groups. And... <coughs> how to say it uh, the purpose of these interfaith groups basically what they like to do is first they want to form a relationship with you and what they'll typically say is they'll say oh no you know really uh, you need to form a relationship with some with some real Jews you need to form real relationship with genuine Jews and what they're really trying to do is they're trying to form a close relationship with you so they can get you to turn away first from the correct doctrine and then get you to turn away from Yeshua. And what they're going to do is they're going to try and be friends with you to get you to value your friendship more than you value service to your master and king and especially his doctrine. Because once you do that, once you step away from the doctrine of Yeshua, it's just one more step of stepping away from Yeshua because we've already taken one step off the cliff at that point. Now, there's also, Yeshua warns us against the leaven of Herod. In Mark or Marcaeus chapter 8 and verse 15, Yeshua charged his disciples saying, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And a lot of people are like, leaven of Herod? What's that? I've never heard of that. Or, oh, I remember reading about that, but, but I didn't understand. What, what is that? Well, the leaven of Herod, if we are willing to accept it, if we have ears to hear, uh, the leaven of Herod basically would be politically based efforts to bring about redemption for the nation. So basically, if you're following a political leader and looking for salvation or redemption or upbuilding of the nation, meaning you're following a human leader as opposed to following Yahweh. Basically, placing your trust in man. Placing your trust in princes. That's basically what the leaven of Herod is. Now we come to Wikipedia. We see that Herod the Great was a Roman client king. That means he was a vassal. It means he was a puppet. And his time is referred to as the Herodian Kingdom. Now Herod the Great is known for his colossal building projects throughout Judea, including, if you've ever taken a look at the before and after diagrams of the second temple, and there was the, the small, little tiny second temple that was constructed in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah versus the big, sprawling complex that Herod the Great put up as a vassal, as a puppet king of the Romans. He greatly expanded the second temple complex. He also expanded the temple mount towards the north. He enclosed the cave of the patriarchs in Hebron. Uh, he constructed a port at Caesarea Maritima. Uh, he built a fortress at Masada and also at Herodium. 
And he was very, very popular among the Jewish people because people could say, wow, look at all these things he's doing for the Jewish nation. This is wonderful. Look, look at what Herod is doing. And this despite the fact that he tried to kill Yeshua and he also succeeded in killing a very large number of small children. And this is, but wow, look at all the things he did for our nation. We're going to overlook the negatives like trying to kill Yeshua and succeeding in killing the children. Well, so can we look perhaps to a political leader in modern times who brings about a political solution to what might be considered a religious problem? And we have people looking to the prince as opposed to trusting in Yahweh. Hmm. Well, also from Wikipedia, we have for one example among many, we have the Abraham Accords. Now, the Abraham Accords, they were a joint statement between the State of Israel, the United Arab Emirates, and also the United States. And it was reached on August the 13th in 2020. Now, subsequently, the term was also expanded to refer to other agreements, such as the ones between Israel and the United Arab Emirates, and also between Israel and Bahrain. So there was a, a normalization agreement between the United Arab Emirates and Israel. And there was also a normalization agreement between Bahrain and Israel. Hmm, a political solution to what might be termed a religious problem. Oh, and a much celebrated political leader who's held up and people adore him and think great things of him, but notice some very strange, interesting things. In the picture on the right, uh, you have President Trump you have the leader of Egypt, and I can't remember if it's the leader of Saudi Arabia, laying hands on an illuminated globe. Hmm, very interesting. Okay, that's one example among many. Do people understand that they're seeking a new world order and that the new world order is effectively an interfaith faith? It calls for certain adjustments, certain allowances, certain, let's say, tolerance and compromise issues in the faith. So what that means is instead of following Yeshua's doctrine, we're now compromising on Yeshua's doctrine. Oh, how interesting. And isn't that the definition of Babylon? Okay. People need to be aware of interfaith ministries. You've got to be smarter than Satan if you don't want to get tripped up by him. And they have plenty of interfaith ministries going on in the New World Order. Yeshua never says to form interfaith faiths. Yeshua never, ever, not one time does he say to work together with these other groups. In fact, that's contrary to his approach. Yeshua says to focus on his doctrine and his doctrine alone and to beware the leaven of the scribes and the Pharisees and to beware the leaven of Herod. It's a very interesting study. If you get the time, I can recommend. It's called The Case of the Missing The. And you can find it in Nazarene Scripture Studies, Volume 3. You can read it free on the website. And... In Luke or Luca chapter 18 and verse 8, Yeshua says, he says, I tell you that Yahweh, his father Yahweh, will avenge those who are persecuted speedily. And he says, nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find, most versions read, will he really find faith on the earth? Meaning, will the Son of Man really find devout believers? That's not what it says in the source text. In the source text it says, but when the Son of Man comes, will he really find the faith on the earth? Meaning, will he really find the sect of the Nazarenes that he himself set up? Will he really find people following the doctrine of the sect of the Nazarenes that Yeshua himself established? Will he really find people walking the way that he walked? And he never used interfaith faiths. He told us to beware of the leaven of the scribes and the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Well, now that we know that leaven is symbolic of sin and sin includes false doctrine, let's take a look again at what we're really trying to do here. 
Shemot, or Exodus, chapter 12, and verse 19, tells us, For seven days no leaven, meaning no sin, no false doctrine, shall be found in your houses or anywhere in your borders. Since whoever eats what is leavened, whoever partakes of false doctrine, that same person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, probably during the tribulation time frame. And this is going to happen no matter whether he's a stranger, think about an Ephraimite, returning Gentile Ephraimite, or a native of the land, meaning an Israeli-born Jewish believer in Yeshua. So isn't what Yahweh really is saying here is that if we partake of false doctrine, we're going to be cut off, perhaps during the tribulation time frame? And if that's so, then shouldn't we take special care to avoid false doctrine for those seven days? And in fact, why stop at just seven? Well, for those who find that question interesting, I would like to recommend two more resources to you, both of which are on the Nazarene Israel website. Uh, Go to the Studies tab and then find the Nazarene Israel Passover study, the final two studies. First study is on ancient circumcision. Now, this is for information only, but we believe we understand how it was that Avraham could become physically circumcised using a different procedure than the one they use today. The today, the procedure they use for newborn males is extremely invasive and cuts away a lot of flesh. The, without modern treatment, there's an extreme risk of infection. There's also an extreme risk of bleeding. Uh, all these things could be very dangerous for an, a man who's well along in his years. We believe, and we show in this study, there's another way that is, has far less risk of bleeding, far less risk of infection, especially in a desert environment. Uh, we post this for those of you who may live in a place where males are not circumcised on the eighth day so that you know what to do if you live in a place where circumcision is not common. However, we would say we advise this for information only, and if you choose to have that procedure done, please have it done by a qualified medical professional. Second study, for your dining pleasure, we have a plethora of unleavened bread recipes. We have a lot of unleavened bread recipes uh, there on the website. That's the URL if you're interested in the URL. However, it's the last chapter in the Nazarene Israel Passover study on the website. We chose not to put it in the book because it would would just uh, cause the book to be more expensive and larger. But this way, if you don't have access to organic or at least natural matzah, but you have access to natural grains, you can make your own unleavened breads. Or you can also make a lot of very delicious unleavened breads and the recipes are all right there. And on that note, I would like to invite you all to join us for Yahweh's seven-day Hag Hamatzot challenge. You've heard of a 50-day challenge. You've heard of a 40-day challenge. This is Yahweh's seven-day challenge. And in this seven days, he challenges each and every one of us not to partake of any sin, not to eat any food that's leavened, and also to avoid false doctrine for seven days, hopefully longer. Because false doctrine, that's what will get you cut off from the nation of Israel, probably during the tribulation time frame. But the thing is, in order to avoid the false doctrine, first we need to know what Yeshua's true doctrine is. We need to know what was the original walk that Yeshua walked so that we can imitate him. And in that, the Nazarene Israel website stands ready to help you. So happy reading, and please join us for Yahweh's seven-day Hag Hamatzot challenge. Shalom.